Michael Granov, thank you for granting me this interview, although in COVID times we are in this virtual uh, connection. I am uh, sorry not to be able to be with you, Ilva, in person, but I am happy to do it uh, remotely with you from America. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is the first time, actually, due to uh, coronavirus, that you couldn't be in person in Tirana during uh, the annual board review that the American Albanian uh, American uh, Development Foundation do on a yearly uh, basis. Uh, for how long do you believe Albania and Albanians will still need AAEF present in this country? Well, you know, it's an interesting question, Ilva, because the, uh, the nature of our foundation is actually to be perpetual. That is to be in Albania for an unlimited amount of time. Um, and that was how the foundation was designed. And I think that the foundation should be in a position to help Albanians and help Albania develop over the long term without any end sight just the way that foundations in America work. And uh, let me ask you and cut, cut it short to the chase and ask you directly. Aren't you growing tired a bit of Albania? <laughs> it's, an, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, no, you know, I think um, my experience in Albania has um, been quite an energizing one. It's not uh, often that you get a chance to witness history, to maybe have some positive effect on it. And so I've actually found that my experience, and I think this is true of all of our board members and all of our staff, instead of taking energy from us, I think actually our experience has given us energy and, and uh, every step kind of gives us more energy to keep going. Uh, Michael, after more than 25 years, as I said at the beginning of this interview, of uh, commitment in Albania, the foundation has directly invested $109 million, uh, created over 7,000 new jobs, uh, and uh, a contribution of a, over $2 billion uh, uh, to Albania's GDP. In the third decade of your presence in Albania, are you satisfied with the impact that uh, uh, the work, the engagement of the foundation has had in the development, both in the economic and democratic areas? Well, Ilva, I'll try to answer your question in two ways. The first is, I have to admit to you that the, um, the nature of my own personality is never to be satisfied. And so there's part of me that always sees things that we can do that we haven't done before and I'm never satisfied with the progress that we've, that we've had. But on the other hand, um, I, I think that we've been able to demonstrate considerable progress over time. I'm happy about that. I'm grateful for what people have done. I think we've made a difference in Albania um, and I feel, um, I feel proud of that contribution. Michael, you're never satisfied, but uh, you are still an optimistic. So you only have a positive uh, record of what you're doing? Or let, let me be again more direct. How do you explain the fact that Albania, uh, as a country and as institutions, they still need the foundation help to be able to become sustainable? So um, I think one of the things that uh, everyone needs to realize is that uh, development is not a destination, but is actually a journey. And all countries um, are on that path um, of development in some way or another. And it's true that the, uh, the path that Albania has taken to development has been a winding path. And it's not that there haven't been issues or things that have stood in the way or things that have held Albania back. That's true for Albania and it's true for, um, for all countries in this way. And so it is a, it is a journey um, and not a destination. And I don't think that we will ever reach the point where no further development is necessary. And I think you can look at the United States and uh, see the same thing.
uh, only forward some period of time. I agree, Michael. It is a journey, but depends how we are behaving during this journey. Uh, is the fact that the foundation is still very much involved in the country's development a sign of lack of development in terms of capacity building and democratically functioning society? I think, Ilva, that um, the, on the one hand, the um, activity and existence of the foundation is not an indication of a failure, let's say, on, on the part of uh, Albania to develop, no more than the presence of the Gates Foundation in the United States would be an indication that the United States somehow wasn't developing. I think that these institutions need to work together. On the other hand, as I mentioned to you, clearly there are things that, are, that have held Albania back, are holding Albania back, and it would be uh, much better if Albania could make substantial progress in those areas. And you mentioned them. Obviously, um, there's been a lot of discussion um, over the last months and years about uh, democracy and uh, judicial reform and all of those things, which are very, very important. And you also mentioned capacity building and institution building is a very, very important part of development. So I, I, I don't want to imply that um, there aren't problems and there aren't things to be done. There are, but certainly the presence of the foundation and the activity of the foundation, I think is part of good development over time and not an indication um, that there's something wrong with development. Michael, you have been in Albania uh, present in uh, very difficult times and in normal times. Uh, these, uh, these days are not very normal. We are uh, ahead of uh, parliamentary elections and the political polarization is high, uh, as high as, as ever. Uh, do you have a message for the Albanian politicians in both sides, the majority and the opposition, uh, when it comes in terms of letting the country breathe and being able to be attractive to foreign investments, which is apparently not the case and we are suffering to attract them? Well, you know, I think that uh, my message would be to uh, the people of Albania that they should um, exercise their right to vote, they should exercise their right of free speech, and they should communicate with their government uh, representatives um, in the opposition of what, what they would like to see. And the role of government and the role of political parties is to represent the people and to uh, create the kind of infrastructure and foundation that fosters uh, good government and good government policies over time. And that's a big responsibility. It's a responsibility that we all have as citizens and it's a responsibility of all political participants to be representing their constituents and representing the country more broadly. Michael, in your view, why do you think Albania is having a hard time to attract foreign investors in Albania, in this country? Well, obviously, over right now, we're dealing with a, a dramatically changed economic situation uh, where uh, people aren't, can't travel, can't move around. And obviously, everybody in all countries have become a little bit more uh, insular in that way. And that certainly prevents um, more foreign direct in investment. In order to attract more foreign direct investment, I've often tried to compare countries to companies. You know, I run a company in the United States and I have competitors. And in order to succeed, I need to perform better than my competitors. And in some ways, the challenge of attracting foreign direct investment is not so different. That is that all countries would like more foreign direct investment, and in effect, they are competing with each other for it. And therefore, the way, the way to be a successful competitor is to look around and see what the best people around you are doing, what works and what doesn't work, and to come up with a strategic plan that you think can uh, do better than what competitors are doing to attract foreign direct investment.
And so that's been my advice in general over a long time for the best way to, uh, to attract foreign direct investment. But the nature of your question is right, is that some of the things that make countries more competitive are in the economic sphere, but some of them are in the sphere of democracy, are in the sphere of good government, are in the sphere of judicial reform. And it's, a, it's one package. It's hard to take out a single element. So, uh, better com uh, uh, competitive uh, environment uh, will help the climate of investment. Uh, how do you evaluate the current cooperation that you have with Albanian authorities? Well, Ilva, you know, um, from the very beginning, when I first started to come to Albania, I realized that um, uh, given Albania's size, um, our fund and foundation was going to need to interact with government in a way that was probably more extensive than most of the other foundations um, and, fun and enterprise funds that were created across uh, Eastern Europe at the end of communism. I also realized that it was very, very important for us to remain above politics, that in a way we were serving the Albanian people and not uh, anybody who was in power or not in power at a given point in time. And therefore what we needed to do was cultivate very good relationships with people in government and people who are in the opposition. And that strategy has worked very well over a very long period of time. And in a very hyper-political environment such as Albania, we've never seen the fund or the foundation kind of dragged into the political side of things. And the reason is, I think people understand that what we're doing is in the interest of the country. And in that regard, I think we've had quite good cooperation from all kinds of government entities, from local government, municipal government entities, uh, like the city of Tirana, to the national government. And we've tried to form productive partnerships uh, with various ministries dealing with our projects and our, and our interests over time, and try to uh, move them in a positive direction and I think that's one of the reasons, actually, we've been uh, so successful over so long. So I'm, I'm happy about the partnerships that, that we've had, and, um, and I'm happy with the relationships that we've been able to develop. And actually, I did see you with the Albanian authorities, the mayor of Tirana, the prime minister during the TUMO uh, uh, opening in Albania. And actually, I was kind of jealous for my kids. They cannot make it. It's only for 12 to 18 years old. Why did you actually invest on this uh, age group? And uh, what's, what's the main aim that you have about TUMO? So if you, if you thought about the future of Albania and the future, frankly, of any country, and I asked you to uh, think about a couple of the most important factors, you would probably talk about our children and you would probably talk about technology. Clearly our children are our future, not just Albania's future, but the world's future. And clearly uh, the role of technology is, is more and more important and more and more fundamental. And interestingly enough, even in a time of pandemic, technology is something that allows you to um, go across borders. There's no, there are no geographical uh, lines in, in technology. And so we thought that uh, something that we could really do that would be significant over time would be to help provide digital education to, uh, to kids in Albania. And so what we did is we, we, we try not to reinvent the wheel. And so we looked around the world for the best models of digital education. And interestingly enough, the best model that we found was not in Silicon Valley or somewhere where you'd expect it, but happened to be in Yerevan, Armenia. Mm -hmm. And the people at TUMO had developed really a world-class model for how to, how to deliver digital education that has now been opened in other cities like Paris, like Moscow, so now you, um, all over the world. And so we went to, to Armenia, talked with those people about bringing that model to Albania and, and adapting it. Now that and so that's what yeah. we've done. Yeah. Now that you uh, invested in TUMO, will you still support the Junior Achievement Program in the field of education? 
Yeah, these things are not uh, distinct in that way. So one doesn't negate the other. So this is part for us of building a broad portfolio of projects and programs that are going to, uh, in this case, uh, deal with education and deal with Albania's kids. So they build on each other. They don't uh, negate each other uh, in, in any kind of way. Um, and so I, my hope is that over time, this entire portfolio that we've created, whether it's junior achievement or whether it's TUMO or whether it's other educational programs, that they, they form a broad-based uh, set of programs that really can move the needle and help Albania's kids uh, grow up and compete in the world to come. When will the pyramid uh, be finished uh, since uh, you are working on it? And what's your feeling uh, and impression when you think that that was a museum of Enver Hoxha? Legacy. So a couple of things. First is that um, we wanted very much to get the TUMO program off the ground quickly. And the reconstruction of the pyramid is going to take a while, obviously. It's an old, neglected building in many ways. And we didn't want the program to be subject to that construction. And one of the things that I'm actually quite proud of is the ability of the foundation to uh, work and develop its programs even in the midst of the pandemic. And I would call that resilience. And I think part of our job in Albania is resilience is our ability to navigate situations over time and still be able to deliver for the Albanian people. And so I'm, I'm quite proud of the ability of the foundation to start TUMO and operate right in the middle of this pandemic. It shows you something about resilience. The pyramid um, obviously is a highly symbolic uh, building in Albania um, that stands right in the middle of central um, Tirana. And so ultimately locating the TUMO program in the pyramid, I think has a, there's a substance to it in terms of digital education, but there's also a symbolic value, a symbolic value of uh, addressing the future of Albania's kids in a building that, uh, that originally looked backward um, at that time of dictatorship. So I think it'll probably take, um, a year or two to do all of the construction that is that's necessary. But my hope is that at the end of the day, we will have this program, which will give so much to Albania's children, located in this highly, highly symbolic building that will give hope to the people of Albania. Michael, and a final question about what I'm sure you might have heard uh, in Albania. There was a little bit of controversy regarding uh, the foundation's involvement in the Buterin site. Actually, you are planning to invest $7 million uh, to the project over upcoming seven years. Why is the foundation interested in investing in Buterin? And uh, if you have heard about the controversy, why there are not Albanian archaeologists involved, uh, how would you respond to such critics? Well, so first, um, one of the key areas of uh, activity for the foundation has been cultural heritage from the beginning. And actually, Boutrent was um, one of the first projects that the foundation got involved in, because obviously Boutrent is one of the most important cultural heritage sites in the country. And I actually learned about it even before that, um, because of the involvement of Lord Rothschild in creating the Boutrin Foundation probably 25 or even more um, years ago. And Lord Rothschild and I have been friends for a long time and collaborators for a long time in many, many different areas. And so I learned about Boutrin uh, from him and our activity began uh, quite a long time ago with the installation of electronic ticketing machines to try to provide more transparency there. So Boutrint has been an interest of the foundation uh, for quite a long time. And what we try to do in, in Boutrint is to help the government create what we always do, um, a world-class management model to make sure that Boutrint would be developed in a responsible way and would be open and available, not just to the citizens of Albania, but as a channel for, uh, for tourism for people abroad to come and see this incredible uh, site. Obviously, uh, our 
our involvement is to make sure that uh, that that happens in a in in the best possible way. The government of Albania uh, obviously has uh, ownership of the cultural heritage sites, including Butrent, and there's and that continues and will continue forever. Um, and the structure that we've worked with the government on for Butrent is one where. Uh, this management plan it can advise the government on how best to manage the project and report back to the government in that kind of way. So there was never any idea of transferring ownership or anything like that. And, um, and when you hear about the critics and the controversy in Tirana uh, from New York, where I think, where I believe you are, what do you, what do you think? You know. Um, I, um, Aren't you tired I'm, and saying, what's, what's the deal with these Albanians? No matter what I do, they still have something to say on this regard. <laughs> well, you know, I think, well, first is everybody has the right to express their views, and uh, I want people to, to, to do that. Um, one of the things about having programs like ours over a long time mm -hmm. is that we do live in the public policy arena and we have to expect that there will be people that may be critical of what we do in one way or another. And we have to just make sure that what we're doing is honest, direct, transparent and works. And I'll just give you one example. When we installed uh, electronic ticketing machines in Butrent, what we found is that the revenues went up by a substantial amount. And it was not because there were more visitors to Butrent. It was that essentially we had ended the uh, corruption where ticket revenues were not going to Butrent. And one of the things we know about corruption is that there is a saying in English that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And one of the things that we try to do in all of the projects we do is to make sure that we're a good example of sunlight. We're a good example of uh, making sure that we uh, address corruption issues. And one of our goals in dealing with Butrent was to make sure that the money that came into Butrent would stay in Butrent, would be used for Butrent. And that was part of the reason why uh, we, working with the government, uh, created the structure that we did to make sure that, that Butrent would be developed in the responsible way that it deserved. Michael, since we seem to be still in our troubles here in Albania and ahead of an electoral year, uh, can I ask you if you have already voted or who are you rooting for? Uh, you can ask me if I've already voted, but you can't ask me who I uh, <laughs> voted for, or at least I can't tell you. So I okay. uh, will tell you that I actually have already voted by mail um, in New York, um, and I hope that uh, Everyone else in the United States does too. So I hope that people really exercise their right to vote. And I hope that turnout increases substantially. And I think uh, that'll be a good thing um, for the American election. And I, you asked me before, I hope the same thing is true for the Albanian elections next year. Thank you very much, Michael Granov. Uh, and looking forward to meeting you next time in Tirana. And thank you for your interest in Albania and Albanians' uh, development. Thanks, Silva. I look forward to seeing you in person soon, I hope.